participants. Um, a ransomware um, I've, I've mentioned, and then botnets is more of an infrastructure. It's a, it's a way how these bad guys use um, unsuspecting machines, like computers that are, uh, you know, not necessarily adequately protected, and then they infect them with so-called little bots or little programs, and they then listen in what the command center tells them to do, and then they can be used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. Um, sending out spam, creating something that's called distributed denial of service attacks, which is just generating a lot of traffic um, or sending um, even, you know, malicious software like ransomware via these machines. Um, why is that important? Because if you're at home and you, you ha happen to be connected to the internet with your, your devices, and it's also more and more of us have these IoT devices at home now, um, to make sure that those can't be um, compromised and be part of this, these botnet campaigns. I mentioned the data set that's most interesting, and this is, by the way, so even if you work for a bank, for example, the, the criminals are more interested in the personal information that the bank sits on than, than the money. I mean, ultimately, it's always about the money, definitely, but um, personal information is definitely um, right on top there. And then obviously banking credentials, uh, username and passwords, that's, that is um, all information that is um, interesting, interesting to the, the criminals. Um, in South Africa, we have this um, fraud prevention service. They've released their stats um, that said that identity theft since the pandemic went up by three times. And that just talks to the whole point of, you know, you know, some of my friends, when I tell them, you know, you have to be careful with your personal information, you have to make sure that nobody can hack in your email. Um, and then they say, well, what's, you know, and I don't mind, like my information is out there anyway, what's the big deal? And this is the big deal. If they can use your profile or your personal information to create fake profiles and then, you know, perform identity theft for the victim, it's absolutely awful to get back out of that um, situation like it can take up to two years to prove that it wasn't you who took out that loan account it wasn't you who purchased all these um, goods online you know and um, it, it really is not a nice thing to go through and hence why it's so important to um, make sure that we have a hold over our personal information something else i found interesting also uh, from a south african stats um, is that in terms of banking fraud or sort of um, financial you know, transaction fraud, in the mobile banking side, the biggest problem there is not necessarily that the app that you know, the, the users are using is a problem. It's 90% it's or more than 90% is, is um, related to SIM swap attacks, which means that the fraudsters will somehow either coerce with the, tele, the, the telco or the telecommunications provider or they, um, they trick them into porting the victim's number onto their phone number in order to get the OTPs to do the, the financial transactions. Um, so that's a real issue, particularly anywhere in Africa where mobile, you know, anything mobile, mobile financial transactions, mobile payments, mobile banking is, is such a, a big thing. And um, uh, particularly in, in Nigeria, I know that you have some fantastic companies in the FinTech space and, um, us too. I mean, I don't know. I would love to hear how it is um, in Lagos or, or wherever you are maybe based. But in, in South Africa, I, I don't use cash at all anymore. Everything is done through my mobile payment app. Um, and, uh, you know, we are the continent with uh, the highest mobile financial transactions um, in terms of actual numbers uh, in the world. But that also puts us on the map for cyber criminals that are interested in tricking our people and stealing their money. Something else I thought would be interesting to talk about, and that which happened um, in South Africa, uh, just well in July this year, we have this, um, it's a public uh, organization called Transnet and they're responsible for all our road systems and the harbors and the ports. And they were hit by, by ransomware. And I mean, I have to say that the, the IT team, you know, I, I know of someone that, that works there and they, they went up, you know, working 22, 24 hour days and they proactively took down their systems to make sure that the infection didn't go all over. But what that meant was that they had to take down the systems that control the um, operations of the container ships arriving at the ports. 
And that was down for a week. Now you can imagine how much traffic, like how many container ships are arriving in Durban, for example, 60% um, of all our imports comes via this port. And now these container ships couldn't offload the containers because the systems weren't available. And yes, they did like some paper-based, um, you know, backup systems, but it, it was complete chaos and it had a massive impact on our economy. And it's just here to show you how, um, highly impact of this problem is not just for individual companies but for societies really in our overall economy the other thing that we had that we happened also um in south africa and i'm sorry i'm using so many examples from from here but that's obviously where i'm, I'm plugged in um is and i would love to hear you know like stories from from nigeria but our Department of Justice has been hit by ransomware. And now what that meant was that our court systems, the magistrates where we, you know, that everybody's reliant on, on digital systems, you know, the recording that they use in the courts, um, in, like talks to some server, et cetera, none of that was available anymore. They couldn't do the, the payments for um, child support. So again, this has a massive impact on the society and our citizens um, when our public uh, infrastructure or critical infrastructure companies are being hit by these gangs. And um, unfortunately, you know, being in Africa and um, sort of not having the same resources that an America or the UK may have in terms of national power to come after these um, attackers. We don't have the regulations in place. We don't have the skills or the resources. Yet we do have quite a lot of um, industry that is highly cyber dependent. That puts us on the map for these, um, these criminals that will probably shift their attention more towards the emerging economies because you know, in the US, President Biden declared ransomware a national threat. So they really come after these guys. Um, also, as, you know, sort of the more mature organizations are clamping down on the, on the um, uh, you know, um, security controls. Um, it means that these guys will look at us in Africa and um, see us as sort of a low hanging fruit and an easy target. And that will have an impact on our economy. And that's something we really don't need. I mean, we have, um, yeah, all over, we've got um, issues with youth unemployment and, um, you know, str still struggling to recover from since the COVID lockdown. So we need our economy to, to flourish and this has an impact on it. Um, if we look at how these ransomware gangs operate, so in the past, typically what would happen is they, they break in, in most cases, through a phishing email. So they send you an email and it looks like some, you know, some, from somebody that you may trust or know, and then infect your machine. And then often they would spread from your machine in the network laterally to other machines and then encrypt the data that is on those machines. And then only once you pay a um, ransom amount mostly in Monero or Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency, you would then get what they call the decryption key and then um, you can decrypt uh, the data and you have your information back. Now, if you had good backups and they didn't encrypt the backups, you could, um, you know, sort of recover um, and that made this kind of threat not that um, effective, even though they still, they, they uh, extorted a lot of money that way. But since December 2019, they upped their game a little bit. So they said, okay, we don't get enough victims to pay out. How can we put more pressure on? Um, so the way they work now is that, yes, they will also still, mostly through social engineering, get into the environment, um, maybe encrypt uh, the, the target machines, but then also what they do is they actually exfiltrate the data. So they steal the information that they find, they take their time, they really sort of learn about the environment. To give you an example, um, there was one case where, where the victim said, um, the, the, the attacker said they, they wanted $2 million to get, um, you know, to, to get them to uh, get their data back and to not, they threatened to uh, sort of publish the data that they've, that they've stolen. And the victim said, we don't have $2 million. I can't get you that money. And the attacker said, no, you do have $2 million because we've read your cyber insurance policy. We know exactly how much um, you covered for, and that's the amount you, that, that you can get from insurance. So you better pay up. So they really go in, they, they analyze the situation, they read the, the interesting documents and then hit you with whatever is most relevant. What they also do is sort of, uh, they call public shaming sites, where if you don't, um, 
you know, collaborate in the negotiation, they will then make it public that they've hit you. Um, and it's it's a real ecosystem. I mentioned early on, you have these different groups um, in the ransomware or extortion crime field as well. You have what you call the operators. They're the ones who write the software. They're the ones who run the infrastructure. And then they work with so-called affiliates or like an, a channel network really that um, can rent the software as a service and goes out and infects the victims. And once a, a victim is um, infected, they then go back to the operator to do the negotiations and then they split the, the, the takings. Um, so it's really effective because that means that some of the these affiliates are not necessarily, they don't have to be uh, that savvy in terms of uh, you know technology because they work with the operators to do all the technical work. And um, at the moment, the FBI has checked uh, just about 100 different ransomware strains, and that is growing. Um, here's a, an example of a public shaming site of um, an operator called Avedon. Um, they are quite sort of sophisticated. The way they do it is that when while you're in a negotiation, it's it's red, and then when you once you agree to pay, you you turn a green. Uh, your avatar changes, and even the the way they chat um, with their victims is quite um, professional. Actually, you know, they really. By the way, they also see themselves as not as criminals, but as service providers. They talk to their victims as partners. Um, so it's quite crazy how this um, whole ecosystems, uh, ecosystem works together. This is just a few uh, links of the most notorious um, operators and their shaming sites. So when you go there, you can see who they fit. Um, and obviously, if you, if you work for a big organization, you don't want your name on, on these sites, right? Um, Sophos brought out a report earlier this year where they looked at, you know, what's the sort of average hit rate across the world. And Nigeria, and this was in January, um, Nigeria um, had a 22% um, sort of affirmative rate amongst the respondents, South Africa 24%. But we've actually in South Africa just the other day, and we are going to try and do the same survey um, in Nigeria, um, Kenya, and a few other countries as well. But we've just finished the survey in South Africa in, in September. And there 32% of the participants said, no, they have been hit um, by a ransomware attack in the past. And 4% um, actually multiple times. So that's quite um, worrying that the trend is definitely going up. And that is, if you think a third of our business is being hit already, um, you know, just shows you the reality of this. Um, in terms of how much does it, does it cost to recover and remediate? Um, again, the, that SOFOS report um, reckons, and I couldn't find Nigeria in there, unfortunately, otherwise I would have shared this, but in South Africa, and it, I, I assume that Nigeria, South Africa would be pretty similar, um, the average, remediation cost is in the region of half a million dollars. Um, obviously, that depends on the size of the organization, something like that Transnet um, incident that impacted like, you know, so much of our um, imports, that's in the billions, you know, the actual damage to the economy. So when we went out and we asked our um, South African organizations, you know, what did you experience? What type of extortion attack did you go through? You can see that over half of them had um, just encryption of data, which is, you know, that's um, that's natural because that's how ransomware worked up until, um, you know, the end of, of 2019. Um, but then quite a few also said, well, we had encryption of data as well as exfiltration. And then 7% said, no, they actually only stole the information and then threatened us, um, you know, to to release the data um, unless you pay up. And then in the banking industry, that the banks are, are used to this um, for quite some years. There's this thing called distributed denial of service attacks, which is yet another lever that they put pressure on, where they throw so much traffic at the the company's websites or their their internet lines. Um, and it basically cripples them. So it's another way of, of basically extorting um, or pressurizing the, the victim. And now this is where it gets interesting is we asked the, the companies, what did you do when you fell victim? And 18% um, said they didn't know, 78% of the respondents said they recovered somehow internally, they're from backups or they, you know, they just, um, I don't know, let their customers know, et cetera. 
4% said they paid the ransom. Now you may say, well, 4%, this doesn't look like a, a lot, but it's actually a really, really good return rate. If you talk to anyone in digital marketing, having a 4% hit rate is exceptionally good. And that means, because especially if you don't have to do much work for it, right? Like um, these affiliates use the operator's software. They just send out massive of spam emails and only once, um, somebody falls for it or once they get into the environment they do a little bit of work in terms of um, researching what's going on and then in the negotiation phase but if four percent of those victims actually pay out that is really quite a good um, well profit making enterprise and explains why so many criminals are in it um, we then also asked you know what what was the root cause like how did the the, the ransomware actually get into your environment and the majority of the, the respondents said, so 27% said um, social engineering, which is sort of the, you know, th mostly through phishing emails that the initial infection got in. That's followed by unpatched software, misconfiguration, and password issues. Um, this is also in line with a lot of other reports that we see where um, really social engineering is, is right there on top, Microsoft RDP. Um, unpatched software and credentials theft are sort of the, the number, uh, well, the top four or five um, reasons of why, not just ransomware, but why any um, data breaches or, or hacking attacks are happening. Um, yeah, there we go. This is another a stat just to show you how social engineering um, in any form of data breach is right on top there. Um, and that also shows us, again, how important it is to protect ourselves, the people, from these types of attacks. Um, what does it mean in our social engineering? Like they're hacking the human. Obviously, they're lazy. That's why they're criminals. And it's easier to hack us than try to break through, you know, fancy technology. And, um, you know, if we look at what social engineering really means, it's not just something that's confined to the cyberspace. You probably, we all have met uh, some social engineers in the real world, uh, this con artists that try and trick us into um, taking an action that's not necessarily in our best interest. And why does that work? Well, um, you know, we think we're so sophisticated, but we're actually still very primal animals and we react onto like react to our emotions um, and what happens with the with the cyber criminals that use social engineering what they want what they want us to do is um, to switch off our critical thinking and the way they do that is that they activate what's called the amygdala or our fear center in our reptilian brain once that gets activated it literally hijacks our prefrontal cortex it means that we don't think logically anymore we become animals if we really uh, react like little scared animals or or it is not even fear only it could be any emotion uh, and it makes us do stupid things sometimes you know so that's what they're trying to do is really um what's called an amygdala hijack is to try and trick us um with our own emotions and the way that they do that is mostly through emails, like they're sending these phishing emails, um, but also over the phone, particularly in Africa, a lot of the, the fraud and the sort of social engineering and pressurizing is, is happening um, over the phone, as well as um, text messages, WhatsApp, Telegram, social media, sometimes also in person. And if it's a very sophisticated attack, it could be a combination of all of these. To give you one example, um, there was a case where the, the victim, um, and in fact, they actually paid out, I think it was a, an Austrian company, where the, the victim was sent emails that looked like as if they came from the, the company's CEO, instructing them to do a payment. And then what the criminals did is they used um, deep fake technology to impersonate the CEO's um, voice and then they left a voicemail on the victim's um, phone that said hey I just sent you this th those emails I really need you to get on this this payment needs to be made urgently and you can imagine if you're some clerk in a company you receive email and a voicemail from your CEO you get on that right and they ended up um, transferring millions of, of euros um, to the wrong or the fraudsters account 
So, okay, but what can we do about it? Like cyber security and you, um, how can we take that home and, and protect ourselves against that? Um, and I thought one of the ways of explaining that could be uh, through sort of the COVID hygiene protocols that we were all, you know, um, I don't know, like um, being bombarded uh, with by our governments and, and everyone. So we have these things that we have to do on a daily basis to protect ourselves, wearing a mask, sanitizing, washing hands, etc. And it's the same thing that we we sort of we are aware of, and it's maybe a nuisance, but we do it because we know it protects us. The same things apply in a way to the cyber world, and we have to apply good cyber hygiene at home. And there are five points that I'd like to um, just you know, briefly cover on. The first one is to be aware of the social engineering threat, like really, how do they trigger our emotions? What do we do when we feel we're getting, you know, uh, tricked? Um, the second one is to look after our credentials, our um, passwords, um, keeping things updated, security at home, and avoid oversharing or understanding how what your digital footprint um, looks like and um, what it can be used for. So I'm going to go through each of these quickly. Um, social engineering, I've spoke about that quite a bit already. Um, let's look at how they operate. And they the most sort of psychological levers that they use, or the, the tricks to manipulate our amygdala, is um, a low-grade form of fear. Um, and what I mean with that is that they don't necessarily try and scare us to sort of the maximum, but more on a lower level. So they may use authority, like they pretend they're the CEO or some executive. They may use, um, when they dress up like a police person, for example, that's just a, uh, a typical social engineering trick. Um, when they send you messages and say, this is really urgent, uh, you have to do this quickly, else your account will be deactivated. But that releases anxiety in us, you know? So anything that, that makes you slightly scared, that uses authority, that pressurizes you with urgency, those are all called low-grade forms of fear that they use to try and trick us. Another way, is flattery. And that could be, you know, they, they may give you a call and say, hey, I heard you're the best person to talk to. Um, I, by the way, just fell for this just last week, um, not in the in the suburb world, but a con artist um, got me on the on the street. Um, I bought myself a new pair of shoes a few weeks ago that I'm obviously really proud of. And, um, you know, this guy said, hey, nice shoes. And that's how we started um, like I stop usually I don't stop when people talk to me on the street but he was you know like he complimented me on my shoes and then we started talking and he ended up then asking me about um, am I judgmental and I said no I hope I'm not judgmental and then he told me some sub story that he got thrown out at home and um, he wanted money and I said no I don't have money but I can buy you some food and I ended up buying him way too much food um and in retrospect, I realized I've been conned and he used all these techniques. He used flattery to flatter my ego. He, he, he switched off my critical thinking by saying, hey, you're not judgmental, are you? Um, and then once I was in the con, I, I was too embarrassed to get out of it. So I just went with it. And that's how we humans are, you know? Um, so even when you work in this field, you're not immune to it. So be careful about it. Um, greed is another way um, that they get you. Uh, obviously, the obvious one is uh, you played, you won the lottery that you haven't even played in. Um, but it could also be something like a LinkedIn request that said, hey, I saw your profile. I've got this amazing job. Um, and meanwhile, they're just trying to catch you out to hand over more information about where you work, for example. So the best defense really is to be aware of this. And whenever you feel any, any form of emotion, whether that's being worried, rushed, anxious, um, flattered, um, even, even if you feel pity or sort of, you know, you, you feel sorry for the person, just be aware of it that it could be a scam and take a breather. Like it literally just takes a few seconds of breathing and then your amygdala calms down again and your, your critical thinking switches back on. Um, the next thing I mentioned are passwords. Um, Obviously, with you know everything being online nowadays, our identity, like our mostly is our email addresses, our password. That's that's the core of everything. So we need to keep that safe. Um, one way of doing that is to use uh, what's called multi-factor authentication or two-step verification on any accounts that allow it. Um, 
particularly on your social media accounts, your email accounts, anything with finance, obviously. Um, and this is just like a little app, Google Authenticator, for example, that um, you can download. And then whenever you log into your internet sites, it will also then ask you to present as a OTP or one-time password that this app generates. So the, the bad guys have to, uh, if they cracked your password, they also have to get your OTP, which they can get, by the way, if they call you and they fish you. So this is not um, going to protect you against the social engineers, but at least it protects you against somebody who may have stolen your password somewhere else. Um, another good way is to use a um, passphrase rather than a password. Um, in my case, I actually use a song and I use the first letters of each word. And, um, you know, people, when they come to our house and I give them the Wi-Fi code, they're always so impressed. They're like, how can you remember this long password? I'm like, well, it's just a song. <laughs> um, and that actually works quite well. And then obviously for anything, I mean, I've been doing that for many, many years. Um, and it depends on your company where you work, if they allow that for work. But at least for your personal accounts, use a password manager. Um, those, you know, they, they are little plugins for your, for your browsers, and you can also have them as an app on your phone. And what they do is they actually take care of all the passwords. They create unique, complicated passwords for you. And all you need to remember is one long master password, plus your OTP, obviously, your, your two-factor auth, um, to control that, that password vault. Uh, it really makes sense. It's much safer um, doing that than writing down your password somewhere else um, or using, like the worst thing you can do is to save it in your browser um, because that's the first place that that um, hackers will look when they compromise your machine. Um, so definitely recommend a password manager. Also, um, some something that's called email segmentation is a good tip where you use different email accounts for different things. So you have your work email, um, but then you may have one that you use for anything financial, um, then maybe one where you subscribe to all your, whatever you subscribe to, um, because you, you know, if you only use the same email address all over, then if that email address was compromised in one of the breach sites, for example, it's much easier for the bad guys to then try and get into the other side. So try and have different email accounts. Also from a privacy point of view, um, you maybe don't want Facebook to know who you are all the time. Um, then something that I would also suggest is there's a website called haveibeenporn.com. Um, I'm happy to share that again on the chat. And that really allows you to check if your email address or any of your addresses have been leaked on breach sites before. It's very likely that they have. Um, a lot of you know, reputable sites had data breaches. The important thing to do there, if you see your email address on those lists, is to just make sure you change the password that you had on that site and that you don't use the same password anywhere else. Um, the next point is to keep things updated. And what I talk, what I mean about that is also your, um, especially your, your personal devices, your phones, your apps. By the way, get rid, get rid of any apps or software you don't need. Like the more things you have, the more things that uh, may have holes or vulnerabilities. Um, and obviously have some sort of anti-malware or antivirus system that you keep updated. That's really important. Um, and then be aware in the home, um, you know, like I said, a lot of people now have a Google Home or Alexa or some fancy fridge or, or cameras at home, all of which is connected. And um, I mean, this picture, by the way, is, a, is someone who, who shared that his fridge sent them an email about how many times they opened the fridge door. So literally everything is connected. And that means that these things can also possibly listen in. They, can, they could also be compromised by criminals to use those devices for bot networks. Um, so it's really important to be aware of that um, and make sure that you, when you buy the, these things and, and install it, that you change the default passwords. Um, even, even baby monitors have been compromised before cameras. I mean, there's a whole, there's a website where you can go and look at, at people's houses because they have cameras that they haven't changed the, the default uh, login details. Um, and then also, you know, just to consider, do you really need a fridge that's connected to the internet? You know, like if you don't need it, 
um, change it or deactivate it, um, change the default passwords, um, and make sure that your, your Wi-Fi network at home is set up correctly as well. A lot of the times, I don't know how it is in Nigeria, but here um, the, the, the telco industry or the telco company would install the router for the, the people at home, but then they just leave it as admin, admin. And that again, you know, once somebody know yeah, they know that and, and they, they run automated scripts and once they're on your router, they can pretty much, you know, they can see what you see. Um, they can trick you into um, thinking you connecting to your bank. Um, so it's important to keep that that home router secure um, to change your default uh, passwords and your, wi your Wi-Fi settings to something um, like WPA2 or 3. Um, yeah. Now we're coming to the fifth point, which is all about our digital footprints or the breadcrumbs that we leave online. Um, and it's important to be aware of that because a very big component of social engineering um, is what's called open source intelligence gathering or OSINT. And we also do that, by the way, just in day-to-day in -day life. Like, you know, before you meet somebody for an interview or something, you probably research the person, you see what you can find about them online. And that's exactly what OSINT is, is that um, before the criminals try and attack you, they try and find out as much about you um, that they can in order to build this profile about you and then use the information um, to sort of create more personalized attacks. Or it could also be used if they find enough uh, for identity theft. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of breach data or breach sites out there already where some of your information may already be available on the dark web, so they don't even have to necessarily search for it, they just buy these databases. Um, and then they combine it with whatever else they find about you. And I, I think, well, the message here is you get the idea, they, they want to create all this seemingly unimportant bits of information, but if you put it all together, it gives you a really, um, it's like a full profile about the target. Um, and then eventually we'll also give them clues about things like um, address, um, social um, ID numbers, passwords, etc. cetera. Um, so also maybe you share with your family, friends that, um, you know, if they tag you on social media or something that that's again information that's interesting. If you leave reviews about a restaurant or something or a hotel, all of that can be used and abused to possibly then pretend to uh, contact you from that hotel to get you to fall for uh, some, some or other scam. Um, and then, you know, if you work in a company that has a security um, team, um, report something if you see something. So if you see anything suspicious going on, report it. Um, if you're at home and you don't have a like a IT support team, um, I'm sure that maybe uh, the the cybersecurity experts group um, maybe there's some way of reporting uh, scams or fraud. Uh, I'd love to actually hear. Maybe we can discuss that way. Um, consumers can report in Nigeria if they feel they've fallen victim to identity theft, for example. And um, just to summarize again, you know, at the end of the day, it really is about hygiene. It's things we do every day at home as well. We brush our teeth, we floss our, you know, <laughs> brush our hair, et cetera. Those are the kind of things we have to do every day. And the same applies to the digital world. Like there are some things we just have to be wary about and keep ourselves, um, you know, um, sort of, well, keep ourselves safe. Um, by doing these kind of things. Um, and yeah, that, that's really it uh, from my side. Again, thank you so much for having me. And um, I hope that there's uh, time for some questions. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. If you are on, on LinkedIn or Twitter, please reach out. I'm always happy to take the discussion further and maybe um, Ula, like I'd love to actually hear, you know, from a Nigerian point of view, if if citizens or consumers do fall victim, where can they go to, to report or get help from? Yeah, thank you, Anna. That's a very brilliant and fantastic presentation. And uh, the content is so rich and uh, you actually almost touched almost everything. And, and I can also see
see that Nigeria and South Africa share similar statistics with respect to uh, our threat landscape and uh, our vulnerabilities and the uh, history of attacks. And uh, it, it, it shows that this kind of collaboration will go a long way to ensure that uh, both countries are removed from the map of the cyber, cyber crime uh, victims. So uh, now I will be giving, um, I'll be giving um, uh, opportunity to uh, other uh, participants on this call who probably might have questions to ask. So uh, please, if you, ask a, if you have a question, you can please raise, raise up your hand so that I can permit you to, to speak so that Anna can answer your question. I think she's got a few, few more minutes to spend on this call. So let's be as fast as possible. So if you have a question, can you please Raise your hands up so that uh, she can take a question. Thank you. Okay, uh, I see one hand up. Uh, three hands up. Okay, uh, Samala uh, Bako. Yeah, Hi, Sam Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity and thank you, Anna, for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, um, beyond the, the, the rise in um, ransomware attacks and um, the use of um, IoT for distributed denial service attacks, do you see any potential um, um, kind of attack or cyber threat we should be wary of as we enter the new year? Is there anyone you feel will become um, the next big thing as regards to cyber threats and cyber attacks? Um, as a yeah, th thanks, uh, Samela, for the question. So I'm I'm just um, thinking from an organizational point of view, it probably is still like the whole business email compromise is, is very high on the on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Like um, being aware of these guys impersonating your financial directors or CEOs. Um, sometimes what I've seen actually happening in the personal space is that they actually hack into people's email accounts and they sit there and they just wait until anything comes in related to payments or invoicing and then they change the details. Um, and it's particularly if you, let's say for example, you want to buy a house and you have some something where that you need to do a big payment and um, they often actually sit in the, um, the agents, like property agents, are very often infected. Um, also, the the lawyers um, or the solicitors that help with the transaction. So, whenever you've been asked to do a payment, that's there's a large payment. Make sure you call the person to make sure it's the right banking details, or or, or ask via WhatsApp or something that is out of band. Like, don't trust the email invoice only. Um, especially if the banking details have changed. So there's a lot of this kind of fraud happening um, and we see that uh, rising as well. Um, in terms of other scams, like for from a consumer point of view, um, I think anything that's topical, you know, like as soon as there's like COVID vaccine. So then as soon as that is topical, you will get the fake um, vaccination SMSs or um, emails or, you know anything um there's there's yeah that is that is a, a topic or a theme will always be abused by the the criminals so it's, it it means whatever happens in the world whether that's a pandemic or a important soccer match you know um be be wary of the fact that that can be used as well to trick you um and i think for south Af uh, sorry for africa in particular uh, anything on mobile so um yeah, that there's a there will be more things that will come in via chat apps, um, Telegram, WhatsApp, whatever you whatever you may use, um, social media apps to be wary of that. Um, yeah, uh, that's sort of what my thoughts are. Thanks for the question, Samela. Thank you, Anna. That's yeah. Thank you, Anna. So the next person will be uh, John Ajayi. Please, can you ask a question? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, good morning. Yeah. My name is Ajay John. I just want to ask a question that with uh, the increase in the cyber security, cyber attacks, is it possible that somebody, someone will can be hundred percent safe with the alarming rate of this cyber security, cyber threats all around us? That's my question. Uh, uh, sorry, Ajay, I, I didn't. Um, could you just repeat the question? I, I had a bit of a 
Okay, no, let, 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 let me help him out. I just okay. said that is it, is it possible that a person or a country can be hundred percent safe from cyber attack? So <laughs> that's uh, yeah, no. Unfortunately, in, in security, you have this thing. There's no such thing as hundred percent security ever. Um, but what we can definitely do is um, be more prepared. And in fact, um, this is maybe something I don't know if, if who in the audience might, uh, you know, or maybe all or even something we can work together on. Like we had a great workshop with our um, national, like the South African cybersecurity hub, what they call it, which they're responsible from a government point of view for cybersecurity. And they need help because our governments don't have the same resources like America has, right? Um, and so we really need to find a way to collaborate between the finance, like the banking sector, they're often quite ahead in terms of, you know, the technology that they have, the skills that they have, um, the security industry, the telco industry, and the public sector, we have to come together and find ways to prepare everyone, like the SME markets, the larger um, institutions, as well as the citizens to be safer. Um, and maybe there could even be opportunities to collaborate across Africa with different um, countries, because I know for a fact our government struggles, they need more help. I'm sure your government also needs help. And the opportunity we have actually as a as a continent is that we have so many young people that are educated and that don't have jobs and we don't have enough skills in cybersecurity. So one of the, the biggest um, opportunities I see that we should do is um, attract and and skill up more youth to become cybersecurity professionals and then help um, the various industries to be more prepared. Sorry, long answer, but um, you know, there is no such thing as 100%, but there's definitely a lot of things we can do to be more prepared and, and better equipped to uh, protect ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So the last question is from uh, Rotimi Ajasa. Uh, Rotimi, over to you. All right. Um, thanks so much, Anna, for the wonderful presentation. I will want to ask, do you have uh, any suggestion when it comes to um, reporting um, breaches that are caused from organizations or to individual? Is there any better way in which uh, organizations or individual could be able to report? I have noticed that, especially these parts of the world in Africa in general, it's always very difficult for us to report any of the bridges that our organization face or that we face as an individual. It's also very difficult for us to get an accurate data when it comes to the threat landscape here in Africa. What are your suggestions and better way in which this can be reported? Do they have to look at incentives or what are your better suggestions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, um, Rotimi, and I definitely agree that that is a big problem. And in fact, um, that was one of the top priority problems that we tried to solve. We had a, um, a little hackathon earlier in the year called the GovEx Innovation Challenge. Um, because again, I, I'm just talking from a South African point of view, our cyber hub literally just has an email and people can send an email to the to the team there and then they manually sift through the cases and that's not effective enough. Like we really need a better way to A, get um, consumers and organization to understand how they can efficiently report it and then also to categorize the data for research and um, getting better insights. Um, I think that, um, Again, I think that there's an opportunity possibly for the different African member states and maybe work with the, the African Union to come up with a way and a best practice framework or even a, a tool that will allow for better reporting. It currently is, it's not in place. That's unfortunately my, my answer. Like at least in South Africa, it's, it's, it's not um, efficiently handled. Um, I don't know. Um, what the case is in Nigeria, but I, I suspect it's probably similar, right? Um, there's also the whole point of educating the incident responders. I know our uh, government is currently going through a big drive to educate the police force and other organizations that are involved in incident response, um, with like sort of cyber incident response. Um, and that needs to be done more, like more capacity building, um, better systems, better reporting mechanisms. You can't just send an email. It should 
even if it's just a, a better form that people can submit to. Um, so all of these are, are things that we have to do and address and that is currently not in place. And I think we can probably learn from other nations um, and from each other to do that better. Thank you, Anna. Um, what I mean, thanks for the question. Uh, at this moment, there's no any other question. So uh, we, I would just like to ask if Anna has any um, closing remark. And if not, I will just uh, do my closing remark then. We appreciate our quality day. So Anna, do you have any way to end your session? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you so much again for the opportunity. Um, I really love it when we are able to talk about these things. Um, and if there's there's interest, I, I strongly believe that as, as Africans, we have an opportunity. You know, we really have an opportunity to skill up our youth um, and help the world to become a safer place. I mean, the whole security skill shortage, you know, that's not something we only have in South Africa. I mean, they've forecasted that globally, I think we currently have 4 million vacancies in cybersecurity and that's going, that's rising to uh, 10 million in the next two years. So we need more people and we have people that are bright and that um, need jobs. So that's one way of um, maybe looking at it from a positive angle and not just, oh, it's so dire. And, we, and yes, it is dire, we have a problem. And the, the criminals are looking at us, but let's work together, let's collaborate more across the whole of Africa um, and find ways to make it, you know, um, the, the, like, the, like um, grow the opportunity for, for our youth. That, that would be my closing remark. <laughs> Okay. And, get, and sorry, and get your girls to, um, and I know that Confidence Stavely is obviously doing a fantastic job with the Saba Academy um, already um, attracting more girls into the, the industry as well. I think that's maybe one takeaway. If you have a daughter at home or a sister or, you know, a friend, just tell her, hey, aren't you keen on maybe looking at becoming a cybersecurity professional? It's a cool career choice. <laughs> Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, supporting us, uh, our confidence. She's doing very well in Nigeria and we hope that she will do better. Yeah, so I, I would like to end the session this way. Uh, from the last question, uh, where the uh, what team wanted to know if there is any platform for uh, records of cyber incidences and uh, the answer from Anna was no. So I want to think that an opportunity for anybody who have passion for that to have a kind of a, a free portal or a single Google form, go out to encourage people to use it to report cyber incidences. You, you, you never can tell your platform might be the first point of reference when it comes to taking out cyber uh, incidents uh, records in Africa. So that's an opportunity. And I also want to also agree with Anna that uh, in in Nigeria and in Africa, we have a lot of a lot of job to do to ensure that we scale up. And when we scale up, definitely we'll be able to have more than enough uh, army to match up this cyber cook here and there. So uh, it has been a good time with Anna from South Africa. My name is Olabo De Agbola. I am the executive director of uh, training and education on that cybersecurity expansion of Nigeria. So uh, join me to say thank you to Anna, and uh, I hope that sometimes again, we'll come together again on this platform or similar platform to talk again on cybersecurity. Anna, thank you. From Nigeria, we say thank you and we love you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh,